What's going on, everybody? It is Friday night, and welcome back to LTL Media. Back in the studio live here. Let me just get a, some adjustments here. Um, you know, look, we're still working through some technical difficulties. I'm hoping that the microphone sounds a little bit better tonight. But the biggest problem in here right now is sound deadening. And uh, I don't have anything on the walls yet. So we're working through it. Uh, we're getting there. It's been a, <laughs> been a logistical nightmare. But it is what it is at this point. I still want to come live. So I want to welcome everybody in tonight. I hope it sounds a little bit better. Sounds much better. Awesome. Everybody says it sounds better. That's great. Um, I've been kind of studying a lot about acoustics and stuff like that. The biggest problem is, is something that I have that I've never had in a room before is dead center to me is a table. And what I found out is when you're speaking and there's nothing soaking up the sound on the wall, my voice is literally hitting that, that table and projecting out. So we'll work on the sound. I have some sound panels, some sound deadening that I'll be uh, getting back up there soon. So everybody, uh, we're going to do a, a double feature show tonight. And we're going to talk about Karen Reed and Brian Koberger. And if you haven't followed the Brian Koberger case, I think we're going into almost two years. So right about the same time, right about the same time as the Karen Reed case, two years now, and we're still waiting for a trial in the Brian Koberger case, which they're thinking in the spring of 2025. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, uh, just considering all the shenanigans that have gone on in that case. But we're very close to seating a jury here in the Karen Reed case, and we have a lot to go through tonight. So let's start with Karen Reed, and then we'll get into Brian Koberger in the last or the second part of the program tonight. And uh, let me just pull up some articles. So we had a new motion here in Karen Reed's case today. I'm going to read this. This is from uh, Boston 10, and it says, Why is Karen Reed's defense team concerned with the jury box? And this is very interesting because... I noticed something in last Friday's hearing before jury selection, and I want to play a little bit of the video that I heard on a hot mic between Alan Jackson and Liz Little talking about where the jury is going to be seated. And I'm wondering if that question kind of came up then, and then this motion got filed today, and we're going to talk a little bit about that here uh, in this article, but it says, why is Karen Reed's defense team concerned with the jury box? In a high-profile and controversial case, Reed is accused of hitting and killing her boyfriend uh, in Boston, uh, Boston police officer John O'Keefe with her SUV in Canton, Massachusetts in January 2022. Her attorneys say that she's being framed in a wide-range cover-up. Hang on one second. Uh, let's see. I sound quiet now. Calling thousands. All right, let me turn the volume up on the mic, and, and I guess my girlfriend's saying turn the audio up on the mic. Um, okay. Well, let's see here. Hopefully this helps. I'm going to boost up the mic a little bit here. Let me know if that sounds better. Um, hey, Brian, I can barely hear you. Okay, sounds beautiful. Some people say they can hear me. Some people say they can't. Can you give me a heads up if you can hear me or not? Again, uh, you know, we're working through the uh, the logistical nightmares that have been uh, the studio. This is what happens when you rush to try to do things. I can hear you just fine. All right. Now everybody says it's low. Everybody says it's fine. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let's try this. Is that better? Does that sound better? It's fine now. Very low but clear. Is it better now? Does this sound better? Improved. Okay. Volume is low, but it's fine. Okay. Something that we'll have to work through here. Again, it uh, sounds better, Brian. Okay, great. Let's get on with the show. Okay, while Friday marked a pause in jury selection for Karen Reed's murder trial, jurors are still on top of mind, or more specifically, the jury box, which is the latest focus on the defense attorneys who say seating for the jurors in, a court, in the courtroom in the Norfolk Superior Court violates their client's constitutional right 
to confront witnesses face to face because of poor sight lines. And I want to talk about this. I'm going to bring up a video here, like I said, in last Friday's hearing just before um, just before jury selection. And uh, you're going to hear Alan Jackson and Liz Little kind of raising the question about where the jury is going to be seated. It was caught up on a hot mic. But let's see this here. It says the defendant's right of confrontation is affected because that's why we have the juries is to determine the credibility of the witnesses and what the facts are and if they are not able to do and that fully there is a legitimate argument that affects her confrontational clause under the sixth amendment explains nbc 10 boston legal analyst michael cohen in a high profile and controversial case reed is accused of hitting her and killing her boyfriend boston police officer john o'keefe uh, with her SUV in Canton. We know the details there. It says Reed's lawyers have a motion asking to change the seating of the jurors. Uh, will look directly at the witness's testimony during testimony. Uh, they say jurors must be able to see them so they can access their credibility. Uh, they even submitted images uh, of the defense attorney, David Nanetti, on the stand claiming that six jurors will only see the back of the witness's heads. Never. Have I ever seen a courtroom in which the jury box is positioned in such a way that a segment of the jury can only see the back of the witnesses' heads while testifying, Yanetti wrote in the motion comparing the setup to his experiences in numerous other courtrooms in the state. Can I boost my volume a little bit better? Is that better? Is that better? Give me an A-OK -okay here. Because I have it on the loudest setting on everything right now, and I'm probably clipping. <laughs> way better. Much better. Much better. Much better. Okay, we have it all the way up. Again, this is just some things that I'm going to have to work through here. Um, let me see if this, if I can improve this a little bit better. Give me a second. Nothing like dealing with logistical nightmares when you're, is it too loud now? Is that better? I think that's probably too loud. I'm probably clipping now. <clears throat> yes, sir. That's good. I think it sounds great on my end. All right. We're going to just continue with the show. I, I, I will promise that I'll try to work through all this uh, audio stuff because it's uh, been a bit, been a bit much. All right. Uh, so we go back to Never Seen the Courtroom, and here's the pictures. Uh, view from seat number 11. Good question raised. And then you have the view from seat number 12. Yanetti sitting here again, uh, not face to face, which I think is something very, very important. That jury needs to look into the eyes of Brian Higgins. The jury needs to look into the eyes of Jen McCabe when they're testifying. Brian Albert, Colin Albert, and co. The McAlberts. The defense says it has offered an alternative seating ar arrangement. Cohen agreed with the concerns of the Reed, uh, Reed's lawyers, saying, saying, uh, saying sh seeing witnesses is important for the jury and the lawyers. The way the courtroom is set up with the lawyers can't see all the jurors, and what you want to be able to do as a lawyer is to see uh, what's resonating with the jury. It's very important. You know, juries are going to, jurors are going to guide you through this process. Uh, you know, am I am I connecting with them? Am I speaking properly? Am I speaking clearly? Are they understanding what's going on? You know, they may waver. They may start to look around the courtroom. You may be starting to bore them. You don't want to bore a jury. You want to keep their ultimate interest. Uh, and what's they're reacting to and what they're ignoring uh, cause you to stop help uh, help you shape up the balance of your trial. <laughs> The courthouse in Denham is an older building, and seating is already tight. It remains to be seen if the judge will make any changes. I think it's fair. I think it's fair. I think uh, Bev needs to 
make the changes. I think it's fair for everybody, for the Commonwealth and the defense. Everybody needs a clear picture. Everybody needs clear sight of the faces and the eyes that are going to be testifying uh, in this trial. Those people need to be clear to the jurors so they can understand, you know, what is their body language? What is their facial expressions when they're being in cross-examination? What is their facial expressions when they're telling, uh, when they're being questioned by the Commonwealth? I think it's very important. Former jurors needed to be uh, open before statements can turn underway. All parties will return to court next week to finish jury selection. And uh, so let's go to that video that I was talking about. <clears throat> I can see it is really low, the mic. I apologize. We'll get this ironed out. Um, so let's look at that video that I had that I heard on the hot mic. And maybe we could pick up a little bit of this. It's going to be about the seven-minute seven, seven minute mark. It's going to start here. And let's see what we can hear. I'll try to boost the sound on the video so we can pick it up a little bit better. Yeah, right there, Liz goes, I wonder where the jury's going to sit or something to that effect. Let me see if I can turn caps on and see if it's picking any of it up, but I don't think it is. something effective where's the jury gonna sit right here right here she says something to Jackson And I think Liz was the one that actually brought that up. If they sit there, they're not, I, I, something maybe to the fact that they're not going to be able to see. And Jackson said, right. Let's back that up a little bit and play through that again. But I remember hearing this and remember seeing this. And I was like, wow, you know, that I love those hot, the hot mic because you catch up, you catch a lot of things that they're saying before the court starts. Let's, let's play that again. Hey, if they sit there, and I, I can't catch the rest of it, but maybe she's saying, how are they going to see, or something to that effect, and then Jackson says, right. Right there, Jackson says, right. And you can see Jackson counting the jury seats. Just trying to catch up on the chat here. Yeah, uh, Man Man uh, Mandy says, if they sit there, they can't see, I think. That's maybe what she's saying. I don't have headphones in, so I can't hear it too clear. Um, but maybe that's the effect of what she's saying. You know, I caught that. It was funny because I was sitting there and, um, I remember Liz bringing up this, this, uh, this question on that Friday hearing and they're still, she's still looking over. <laughs> Better than bitch, actually. <laughs> yeah. This is 
So they were clearly discussing where the jury was going to be seated there, clearly discussing it. And maybe that's where that raised that concern. It raised the concern on that Friday. And here we have with the motion uh, on this Friday. So almost a week ago, this was raised. And I think they probably had to talk about it. You know, they want everything to be fair, fair for the Commonwealth, fair, very fair for the defense, obviously. You want to be able to look into those witnesses' eyes, see their facial expressions, like I was saying, see their body language. And the computer.
All right, I think I'm back. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. Oh, boy. Uh, sorry about that. My computer crashed. That was fun. <laughs> but we're back. I appreciate everybody hanging out. Uh, again, you know, we've had a lot of uh, technical difficulties here, and we're trying to do the best that we can to work through this. So um, I apologize, and I thank everybody um, for being here. Okay. Um, so anyway, like I was saying, I think uh, Liz had brought up that uh, issue to Jackson this past Friday, and uh, obviously, and they put in this motion. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of off my game here now. Okay, so let's move forward here. Uh, I thought this was very interesting. We had Megan Kelly the other day talking to Vinnie Politan about the Karen Reed case. What's here from this, and then I want to get into, I have a Canva uh, presentation here that I want to get into a lot of things on Karen's case as well, too. The jury selection, uh, the potential witnesses, and we'll go over that this evening, too, but let's play this. Massachusetts, and this one will be before the cameras. It's just getting underway. Vinny, you guys, I'm sure, are going to be all over it at Court TV. Outline what it's about for us. Well, there's a uh, Karen Reed is uh, dating a Boston police officer, Officer John O'Keefe. They go out for a night of drinking in Boston, but it's a cold night and there's a storm that's coming. So they meet a bunch of friends at the mm -hmm. bars where they're kind of bar hopping around. And there's an after party at one of the officer's homes. So when they're done at the bar, Karen gets behind the wheel. John O'Keefe gets in the car and they drive to that friend's house. And this is where the story, one of two things happens, depending upon whether you believe the prosecution or defense. Um, according to the prosecution, John O'Keefe gets out of the car. They're having some sort of an argument. And Karen Reed, while she's doing a K-turn to kind of turn around and head back where she came from because she decided not to go to that party, purposely runs over her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, and leaves him on the front lawn of that home uh, in the cold to die. That's what the prosecution says. What the defense says happened is that Karen Reed dropped him off. He went inside the house. Something happened in the house. There was a confrontation. There was a fight. He was beaten up. He was uh, attacked by the dog, and they dragged his body out onto the front. So again, you know, the basic story here, Vinny's just given the basic story. We'll keep front lawn, here. and they framed Karen Reed for murder by taking pieces of her broken tail light and putting it on his body. So those are the two versions of what happened. So it's either murder, according to the prosecution, or she's being framed and it's a police conspiracy cover-up from the defense perspective. Um, and in the middle is she was drunk and accidentally hit him, but she's not charged with that and she's not admitting that, although that was the original charge against her before they upped it to murder after they found some, some uh, voicemail messages that were left and they tested her backup camera and found that it was working. So based upon that, the prosecution believes it's murder, but that's just. And we're going to play the Banfield um, video from Sean McDonough. Uh, the other night he was on Banfield. Congratulations, Sean. That was a great little segment that you had there, but we'll play that as well. And he's going to talk about the taillight. And we know that Sean has it all down with the taillight. So we'll definitely be playing through that. But let's catch up on here on Megan Kelly's show. Just half oh. the story. That's just half the story. The other story is what's happening outside the courthouse because this case was picked up by a local uh, he's on YouTube. He's a former teacher. Um, and, and he picked this up. His name is Turtle Boy. And he has all these followers who are called Turtle Riders, uh, Megan. Oh turtle Riders. And a couple hundred of them have been showing up at every hearing, protesting uh, the charges against Karen Reed, carrying free Karen Reed signs and, and believing that there's a police conspiracy here. So this has completely divided the town. And right now we're in jury selection and it's not moving as quickly as the jury selection for the most famous man on the planet. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, by the way, how fast the Trump trial is moving. I'm mean, like, I don't, I the, the judge says we're gonna have a jury picked by Monday and opening statements Crazy. will be on Monday, he expects in the Trump trial. You're right, Karen Reed's gonna take longer. John, what's your initial impression of this case? Because I went both ways. I'm just getting up to speed on it, but it says um, the medical examiner ruled the cause of death was blunt impact injuries to the head and hypothermia. 
as though he'd been attacked and then left outside to freeze to death. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell us who did it, right? But then when you get to all the taillight DNA, they found the taillight, her DNA was his, it was her taillight is basically what the prosecution says it can prove um, right by him. I don't know, does that get us there? What else is there? Well, the case is bizarre, if you want to sum it up in a word. And I don't know how much direct evidence there the prosecution is going to have to show. Like, if you think of the backup cameras working, you might see the actual crime in progress. So she might, uh, Karen Reed might have some there there. I mean, her defense is really, I am too drunk to remember if I killed my boyfriend. So I've got plausible deniability. On the other hand, why? If the police are framing her, not why would they frame her, why would they kill their friend, right? Is this some, remember that case that wasn't that long ago where the friends are watching a football game and they all froze outside in the backyard? Like, was it yeah. one of those kind of weird situations? That was drugs, and, and then, I think. And that, yeah, that could have been drugs. And the police were like, I'm a police officer. I don't want to get, let, let's frame the girlfriend who was drunk, too drunk to know any better. Was it that? Or is she just in such complete denial that she doesn't remember running over her boyfriend when she was blackout drunk and having some sort of drunken fight with him? Uh, and the jury is going to want to know, like, if if they're framing her, how did he actually die? And I don't know if the, Vinny might know better than me at this point. Renee, thank you for the donation on Buy Me a Coffee. Yeah, I, I don't need a cup of coffee right now. I need probably a sedative. <laughs> but thank you so much for the support on Buy Me a Coffee. Point, whether the prosecution is going to have evidence in support of exactly how he died. Well, then the, prosecution we is, the, the prosecution is saying he ran her over. So they've got the, the tail light is broken. Her, her her rear right tail light is broken. Um, their medical examiner obviously will say what he's going to say. But again, it's the tail light. So he also had a cocktail glass in his hand, uh, John O'Keefe did, that he brought from the bar. And they say a piece of the cocktail glass was inside her rear bumper so you had the glass from his hand in her bumper and then the tail light from from the rear of her car on john o'keefe yeah. now what the defense is going to say is there's some peculiar things here like why because the snowstorm happens after karen reed leaves so there, she's there or just after midnight, the snow starts around two o'clock. So by the morning, you've got snow on the ground. They're going to say, why is the tail light and the blood on top of the snow? Why isn't it on uh, beneath the snow? They're also going to point to a police chief, a local police chief, who a week after this said that he found another piece of the tail light on the front yard.